1. A few years ago, I was in the process of getting a divorce. My wife had left me for another guy, and I was at a pretty low point. My closest friends were her brothers-in-law, and while they stuck by me, and are still like brothers to this day, it felt weird to me at the time to be hanging out with my soon-to-be ex's family. So I was spending a lot of time alone. I couldn't handle staying at the house all the time by myself, and pretty much any excuse to get out was something I jumped on. Which is how I ended up at a concert at a local bar alone, and where this story really begins. I was actually pretty excited to see this band. They're from our area, but have managed to become pretty big nationally, and they're very popular around here. I showed up early so I could get a seat at the bar and chill, rather than have to stand in front of the stage and not have room to move. I ended up waiting for the doors to open with a relatively small group of people, maybe 15 to 20 of us. One of the others waiting at the door was her. She had the look of someone who'd been on some very heavy drugs for years. I could tell she was probably around my age, but she looked at least 20 years older than she actually was. I could also tell that she was currently on something, and had also been drinking pretty heavily before coming to the bar. She was staggering and slurring her words, but just managed to keep it together enough that they didn't kick her out. She was wearing what I assume she thought was concert attire, but she honestly looked like a prostitute. A tube top with a way too small jacket over it, and an extremely short skirt. This was in February, and it was snowing and about 20 degrees. I'm assuming she thought she was hot, but frankly she was disgusting. She was standing with a group of four or five other people, but kept looking my direction and making me very uncomfortable when I caught her looking at me. Anyway, they finally let us in and I found a spot at the bar where I thought I'd be able to see the stage pretty well, settled in and ordered a beer. This woman and her group wandered around for a bit until it started getting crowded and then ended up standing very near me. She was close enough for me to smell her, stale cigarettes, B.O. and alcohol. Awesome. Once the warm-up band started playing, I managed to enjoy myself. A couple at the bar next to me ended up being pretty cool, and I spent some time talking to them between bands. I had planned on only having a couple of beers since I was alone and had to drive home in the snow, but the guy ended up buying a bucket of beers without asking me and wanted to split it. He'd been cool, so I was like, what the hell? I'll call a cab if I have to. By the time the main band started, I was on my sixth, and feeling pretty good. It was at this point the crack horse started hitting on me. I told her I wasn't interested, and she moved back to her grip for a couple of songs. It wasn't long before she was back, though. This time she started grinding all over me and ended up falling into my lap. I tried to help her off me as politely as I could, whilst hiding my disgust. I'm pretty laid back and I don't like to be rude to people, so I was still trying to be nice at this point. Unfortunately, instead of taking the hint, she turned and wrapped her arms around my neck, and I was forced to stand up and practically dump her off me. If she hadn't had a grip on me, I have no doubt she'd have been on the floor. I forcibly peeled her off me, and once again told her I wasn't interested, and she sulked back to her friends. The next person who came over was one of the girl's male friends. What's wrong with you, man? That girl really likes you, you gay or something? Again, trying to be as polite as possible, I replied, No, I'm not gay. I'm just not interested. Sorry. The two I'd befriended luckily had my back and told the dude to fuck off. The girl even told him I was out of that crack horse league, which definitely made me feel pretty good about myself. He went back to their group, and they moved away, and I went back to enjoying the concert and had a great time. After the show, the couple told me they actually knew the band, and asked if I wanted to go meet them. Of course I did. Plus, I needed some time to sober up before going home anyway, so they led me out the back where the band's tour buses were. I say tour buses but they were mostly old RVs. Anyway, 
got to meet the bands and hung out with them for a bit, which was awesome. I was offered more beer and other things of the greener variety, which I declined knowing I needed to go home at some point. It was then that I noticed Crackhor and her group were still around and they were all staring daggers at me. Three girls and two guys. Once I saw this, I sobered up even faster and finally decided it was probably time to leave since the crowd was getting pretty thin and I didn't want to be there anymore. I walked pretty quickly to my car, which was in a fairly empty area of the parking lot. I could hear the group behind me being belligerent. I jumped in and headed out. Unfortunately, they followed. I could see them get in another car and pull out behind me. It's still snowing. And I know I probably still shouldn't be driving even on clear roads. So I'm trying to stay calm and not do anything to be pulled over. But a car full of angry, drunken druggies on your bumper tends to make it a bit hard to stick to the speed limit. When I hit the highway and they were still right on my butt, I decided, screw it. I'd rather end up with a DUI than dead. So I started trying to lose them. The roads were slick, but I was in an AWD SUV, and they were in an old beater with, presumably, crappy tires. In the first sharp turn I took, I skidded a little on the snow, but held it on the road. They were not so lucky. I watched them slide off the side of the road and into the ditch, and chuckled to myself victoriously. I'm not heartless, though. Even when somebody deserves it, I wasn't going to leave five people possibly injured in a ditch to freeze to death. Plus, I was pretty sure they were going to go to jail. So I called 911 and told them about the accident. I didn't stop or mention that they were chasing me, though. I did not want to talk to the cops or to go back and have to see them again. And I was also pretty sure that while I felt completely sober at this point, I probably still wouldn't pass a breathalyzer myself. So I just made the call and went home. Not sure what ended up happening with them, but I never saw them again despite going to plenty of concerts in the same area since. 2. This happened when I was either 17 or 18. I was technically the creep in this situation, even though I never meant any harm. Before I begin this story, I need to point out that I have a few minor mental disabilities, so sometimes I can't read a situation for what it is until it's too late. God knows I've suffered for that multiple times in my life. Anyway, I used to work at a grocery store. It was rather large, so I had quite a few co-workers I barely knew. One day I was working a rush when I saw a woman talking with one of my co-workers, who I'll just call Mike. They seemed to know each other rather well, and I could have sworn I recognized her from one of the departments. So I assumed she was a co-worker on maternity leave. The reason I say maternity leave is because she was holding a baby boy who looked like he was just a few weeks old. Anyway, the woman came to my register to ring up her groceries when she was done talking to Mike. I greeted the woman with a smile and asked her the typical questions like, How are you? or Do you want this in a bag? I looked again at the baby she was still cradling. I've always been good at taking care of kids, and have helped out at camps, daycares, and regular babysitting jobs countless times in the past. So I asked the typical questions about her baby as well, like, what's his name, and how old is he? When I finished ringing her up, I told her to have a good day, and that was that. I later found out from Mike that she wasn't a co-worker at all, just a regular at the store. I figured that was okay. There were lots of those, several of which I knew, and she seemed nice enough. I saw her shopping with her family quite often after that. Like with every regular I knew, I always offered a smile and a wave when I saw them. One Saturday, I had just finished my shift and was walking out the door to my car, when my mom called me and asked me to pick up some hot dogs. They were all the way at the back of the store, and I was at the front. But I rolled my eyes and began to walk back the way I had come. I cut through one of the aisles to get there faster, and I came across a group of four people taking up the entire aisle. I recognized them as the woman and her family. 
I didn't want to bother them, so I tried my best to walk around them. But they were going incredibly slowly, and no matter what direction I tried to go, I couldn't get around them. Looking back, I probably should have just turned around and walked through a different aisle, but I got to the hot dogs before that even crossed my mind. The family resumed walking, and I got the hot dogs, paid for them, and left the store. I worked again the next day, and of course, the woman and her family came to shop again. I smiled and waved like always and continued work. About 20 minutes later, my manager asked if he could talk to me. I didn't think much of it, thinking he just needed my help with cleaning the bathrooms or something, and I followed him to the back room. When we got there, my supervisor was there too, and I was instantly confused and nervous. To make a long story short, they told me that a woman had reported me for stalking her and trying to hurt her baby. I still remember feeling like I had just been slapped in the face, as I knew instantly who they were talking about, even though I had never laid a hand on the woman or her baby. I explained my side of the situation, also making sure to mention the events of the day before when I was shopping. Luckily, I had known both my manager and the supervisor ever since I had started working at the store, so they believed me and chalked it up to the woman simply misreading the situation. The rest of that day I felt like I was going to throw up. I had come close to losing my job and had been accused of being a criminal, and I was technically still a kid. Even though I had been assured by my managers and later my parents that I had done nothing wrong, I still spent a good few months after that, constantly fearing that someone else with a baby would think of me in that way, to the point where I couldn't even look at another child. I've since gotten over those feelings, but over the years I've learned to be more careful with what I say or do. Luckily, for the rest of the time I worked in that store, I never saw that woman or her family again. 3. There was always something that I loved about the nighttime. The way the cold air hit my skin, numbing my ears and tickling my nose. Golden rays from the headlights of passing cars danced within the reflections in the surface of water puddles, turning pools of murky mess into glittering kaleidoscopes, if only for a moment. Looking up to the sky to be greeted with the speckled lagoon, a world that came alive through the darkness to watch over me as I explored this world. All of these things were magical. Day after day, the setting sun presented itself to me as a white rabbit insisting only that I follow it down the rabbit hole. I seldom resisted this urge, a fact that I should at this point describe as reckless. You see, during the months that I had been indulging in this magical world of the night, I was only a girl of 14. My hometown is a quiet seaside village, quaintly populated with an eclectic mix of characters that I could not envision as threatening. I had lived in my neighborhood for the entirety of my life, and with that came a sense of immunity from the darker cracks of this community, the shady meetings in dark alleys with insidious intent. On this wintry afternoon, my head danced within the nebula of stars above me. I didn't think twice before turning from my road to the left in the direction of the nearby forest, which spanned miles into mountains that rippled the landscape of surrounding towns. For clarity, the exit to my street had two directions. To the right, a road that connected my cul-de-sac to the rest of the town, laden with lights, houses, and the occasional shop. To the left was this secluded forest lane that travelled through the mountains and valleys that surrounded our town. It was a beautiful walk, continuing for miles as it stretched out like a vein. It was speckled with dim streetlights, causing the lane to exist between a strange state of light and dark. Where your eyes twitched in a constant attempt to adjust to the bizarre hue, a flimsy wooden gate ran for miles on the left side of the narrow lane, separating it from countless fields devoted solely to farming. On the right, the lane was sheltered by hedges which broke occasionally to connect to small roads that led to the town. I can't remember how long I had been walking on this night. I don't know why I had chosen the forest lane, as I usually had better judgement than to stray too far from the sanctuary of houses and shops. 
the strongest memory of what happened that night is what came next. I must have been around two miles into my walk when a dark figure emerged from the break in the hedges to the right. I had not seen anybody on my trek thus far and was automatically startled by this sudden appearance in front of me. The silhouette of this figure was small and hooded, standing no more than twenty feet ahead of me. I stopped in my tracks, watching as they scoured the length of the lane to each side of them, before noticing me. As soon as the figure caught sight of me, they took a jaunty lurch in my direction. It seemed like a limp initially, although it was inconsistent which limb was causing such pain, fluctuating from left to right. I struggled to make out any features of this person, their features hidden in the depths of a thick hood lined with fur. I stepped back cautiously as they approached me. A voice within me screamed to just run, sprint away and go home. However, there was something louder within me that recognized that this person could be hurt. Something about them that just didn't seem right. And I was torn as to which part of my judgment to commit to. Emily? The voice was shrill, desperate and female. The woman stopped in her tracks as she noticed my retreat. I paused, hesitant. Under the approaching streetlight, I could see the brief outlines of the face under the hood. Her features looked gaunt, worn, and exhausted. Dark eyes scoured the details of my own face, empty in their depths as they searched for something, the object of which I could only assume was Emily. I'm sorry, I shouted across the short distance between us. I'm not Emily. Her brow furrowed, and her eyes flickered with something akin to anger for a brief second. I can't find my Emily. I hesitated again, finding myself caught between the two voices inside me. I haven't seen anybody down this path. She sobbed. How long have you been walking? About two miles. I haven't seen anybody in that time. Are you with anyone? They might have seen Emily. The question struck me as odd. I was alone before her, the path being linear enough that she could detect that I was alone. Alarm bells began to screech within my mind. I don't know where Emily is, but maybe you'd be better to look in the other direction. Why should I do that? It seemed that a small smile danced around the corners of her lips. It happened over a fraction of a second, but it was enough to shake me into slowly stepping away from this woman. My feet crunched under the gravel, the sound reverberating between us. It caught the woman's attention and she began her own predatory journey towards me. My heart thumped in my chest, filling up my ears with a rhythmic thud. I began to feast upon every detail of her face, aware of the danger before me and refusing to withdraw my stare from it for even a second. I don't know anything about Emily, I yelled, terror now possessing me. Leave me alone. She didn't respond. The smile that possessed her features was heart-wrenchingly sinister. It was a smirk with no amusement, just a hollow emptiness that reflected in the void of her eyes. No expression, no life, just darkness. As she continued to step slowly towards me, I knew that I had to run. Without pausing for another thought, I turned on my heels. That's when I saw him. Within arm's reach of me, a towering man had been approaching me from behind. The same evil glint tarnished his face. But I didn't allow myself another moment to absorb the details. I ran, harder and faster than I ever had before. The ferocity of my feet against a hard path sent shockwaves throughout my body. Heart hammering in its overbearing desire to survive, I screamed trying to draw the attention of anyone who could be listening. I did not know how close they were to me. I didn't want to look. I continued my sprint straight down the path for about a mile, before taking a sharp turn to the left and thundering my way towards the first signs of life. I found refuge in a newsagent's. The small shop was quiet, occupied only by an elderly shopkeeper. My arrival startled him, as I threw myself behind the shelter of a shelf and began to sob hysterically. The next few hours were a blur to me, and I remember only the wave of relief as he took me into the back room of the shop, comforting me whilst calling the police and my parents. 
Nothing ever came from the investigation of the police. I spoke to them twice on the matter, but to no avail. My parents swung between states of relief and rage, and I can't say I blame them. I dread to think what could have happened that night, and even now I have nightmares of how close those hands were, all the while I stepped closer and closer to them. I'm sure that many readers have experienced more dangerous and volatile situations. I understand that this experience could have ended so much worse for me, for that. I would say that this is more of a cautionary tale, from the reflections of a girl who fancied herself a vagabond, but was actually a lamb striding straight into a pack of wolves. Always be careful, be safe, and never underestimate the danger around you. And to the lady with the empty eyes, let's not meet again. Hey everybody, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to Three True Scary Stories, episode 268. I know story number two there was a bit different from the usual, but I always think it's nice to know and again, when you can, throw in a story from the other side of things. Because for every story we get, uh, where there's things genuinely creepy and, and horrifying happening, uh, there are often misunderstandings where it's quite obvious people have overreacted. And also, I must say, the final story there, oh, my heavens, that was well written. Not that the others weren't, they certainly were, but oh, more of that, please. Yes, I very much enjoyed that. Okay, and with that, I'm going to head off for now. So until next time, thank you very much for listening, and take very good care of yourselves.